started. Uh, hello, my name is Trang Weidemeyer. I'm a policy analyst uh, for the Oregon Sustainable Healthcare Cost Growth Target Program. This is our first meeting of the year. Um, it's it'll be a short one, mainly program updates, um, ending with a legislative session update. So we only have 30 minutes on the schedule for today. Uh, for those of you participating, if you can make sure to edit your name so that it includes not just your name, but your uh, the organization you are a part of, um, payer or provider organization or uh, a different one. So this is to help when we get comments or feedback so we know who we're talking to. And if you haven't already, please mute yourself, um, though you can come off mute to ask any questions. All right. OK, there's still some people coming in, but we can go ahead and get started. Uh, Gerandi, can you go to the next slide? All right, so there there's our very brief agenda. Next slide. OK, so this is what we've got for you today. We'll do a quick recap of the current uh, validation for um, the 2020 data, uh, followed by an advisory committee update. They just had their first meeting of the year. Um, a new change to our program's accountability timeline, uh, and then a couple bills that concern the cost growth target program. We uh, think uh, it would be of interest to, to people in this group. All right, next slide. Okay, so data validation. So our second round of data was collected in the fall of 2022. We've met with our payers, well, all except for one payer, um, to validate these files. So happy to say the statewide file is uh, pretty much all there. Um, the one outstanding file doesn't constitute um, a major share of people, so we've gone ahead and created a preliminary statewide file. Um, so there are some stats on the screen for you to look at. Overall, compared to last year, data validation went way faster. Um, so thank you so much to all the payer staff we've been working with um, to validate the files, uh, the way we reorganized our validation meetings, um, I think really helped uh, kind of compress this validation timeline. Also, I know submitting this for the second time and not for the first time definitely helps. Um, happy to report 16 of our files uh, were validated within one month of our receipt of them. Uh, the fastest validation time was 11 days. Uh, compared to one month, a little over a month last year. Um, and the longest is still to be determined because there is one file outstanding, but it's going to be much more shorter than last year's process, which took about seven months. Um, validation also depends on when we are able to meet with your staff. So that's why that scheduling piece is very important. Um, I think we're going to stick with this process we've laid out for this coming fall because it worked so well. So that's, yeah, that's an update on that. Uh, please go to the next slide. So while payer validation is pretty much all done, uh, right now we are going into provider organization validation. So this is where we have one-on-ones with providers. Um, it is almost the end of January, uh, so this month is when we were aiming to meet with all of our large organizations. Um, and I believe at the end of this week, uh, we will have done so. Um, there is one remaining 
large organization we have yet to meet with, but pretty much um, everyone is done, which is really great. We don't have the full list of um, provider organizations, uh, but we hope to finish that at the end of this month, get that list out to all of those organizations and publish it on our web page. Um, this is the same process we did last year, so everybody knows um, who's going to be involved with the 2022 data collection, uh, and then we'll work with organizations to meet with them throughout the month of February uh, to talk about their data. We don't intend to meet with every organization as we did a couple months ago. Every provider organization is going to get their data output and if they want a meeting with us to discuss the um, trends, uh, we're more than happy uh, to hold a meeting, um, but we're not going to um, really uh, encourage meetings with everybody. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, some of those meetings, depending on if we could fit everybody in February meetings, some of those meetings might go into March. Um, and the plan right now is to publish that data, uh, which, which covers spending in years 2020 to 2021. Um, sometime in spring, so maybe late April, early May. Um, so just to recap, the data from this data cycle that we're validating and everything, this data, um, the program is charged with reporting at the entity level the cost trends. So this is for commercial, uh, Medicare, and Medicaid. Um, and by Medicare, we mean Medicare Advantage. So in that April report, there are going to be entity level uh, trends published for everybody, all uh, payers and provider organizations participating in this program. Um, and actually, we won't discuss it at the this tag this month, but next tag, uh, one of our discussion topics is to go over um, data viz options for how to show how best to show this data so we have a couple ideas um, we wanted to run through with this group in particular uh, can i yeah can i jump in there sorry yeah, yeah, yeah. hi everyone sarah bartleman with the program and i just wanted to share that i think we have been hearing from a lot of you um, particularly on the provider organization side about concerns about this upcoming public reporting and really wanting to make sure that we're taking um, whatever steps we're going to be taking or how we are going to be providing context about um, the current economic environment. So inflation and rising workforce costs and COVID and the impact that that had on utilization across this time period. So one of the conversations we want to have with you in February and probably in March is how we're bringing some of that context in and how we are grouping payer and provider organizations in the reporting. Um, I think we might have talked about this with some of you individually, but we don't necessarily just want to list all payers and all providers in one one long list in the public reporting. Um, they're not equal. A large health system versus a, a smaller specialty medical group um, versus a large payer with mostly Medicaid versus mostly commercial. Um, we have a lot of differences, and so we want to think through some options about how do we categorize and group payer and provider organizations in the public reporting, and then how do we add all of that additional context. So that's the conversation Trang is teeing up for February. So just really wanted to reflect that we're hearing those concerns from you and we want to have more discussion. All right, thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, some of you, if you're with one of our large organizations have already gone through this, um, but for everybody else and payers that are interested, uh, these provider organization meetings um, come with uh, a couple different things. Everybody gets a data summary, um, and it's it's basically a space where we run down your data summary with you, um, go over how we collect the data because we do collect it in an aggregated fashion uh, from payer submitted files. 
Um, but in those meetings, we'll go over uh, the cost growth trends across all the markets. We'll also go over a breakdown of patient member months. Um, so you will be able to see um, like which payer file is contributing uh, the most to a certain market. So you can kind of get an idea of where um, these patient member months are coming from. Um, I think that's all I wanna say for this slide. Can we go to the next slide? All right, so I think that's just the update for where we are with provider organization validation. Uh, next, we wanna give a quick update on the advisory committee. Uh, Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to cover these slides also. Sure, or I can do that. Uh, okay. Before we jump in here, are there any questions for trying about the payer or provider data validation or next steps? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, let me give a really quick update from our Cost Growth Target Advisory Committee meeting that was on January 18th. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. There are a couple of slides that we pulled directly from the committee meeting materials um, that give you a sense of some of the key activities that the advisory committee, um, or sorry, key activities of the Cost Growth Target Program in 2023, as well as the potential meeting topics and decision points that the committee will be considering. So again, the committee and the TAG often have um, conversations that are iterative, um, and we wanted to just give you a preview of that. So um, let's go ahead to slide 11, please, Jarondi. Okay, so some of you might be aware that the advisory committee has been having a conversation for the last several months about whether or not there should be any adjustments made to the cost growth target. Um, this started as a conversation about adjusting the cost growth target value, currently set at 3.4%, and whether or not that should be changed to reflect um, higher inflation, a different economic situation than we were when this was all originally set up in 2020, um, and just what does that mean for the program? So the committee had a really thorough discussion on this in November. Some of you might have listened in or seen the materials. Um, back in November, the committee talked about when accountability measures phase in, the list of factors that may cause a payer or provider organization to reasonably exceed the cost growth target, we have explicitly added macroeconomic factors to that list of reasons. So things like inflation would be part of that. We talked about the relationship between inflation and healthcare spending. We shared some data on what's happening both current and historically with inflation and wage growth. We talked about how the committee initially set Oregon's target and gave some context from other cost growth target states about how they are having this conversation and revisiting um, their target values in light of inflation. So there was a lot of detail provided back in November. Um, just to recap some of that. Next slide. I'm this sorry, is... real quick. If I, I I apologize for interrupting. My name is Mike from Edna, but there's a couple other people that's trying to join the call that they're blocked. They're not being allowed in. Oh, I'm not seeing anybody trying to get into the meeting. Trang, can you work on that offline or yeah. on the side with Mike? Sorry about that, Michael. No worries. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no problem. We want people to be here. Uh, okay, so this is our timeline, or this this was our timeline until last week, and I'll talk about the changes in a minute. But um, just a reminder for everybody that accountability measures are phased in. So as Trang was just saying, this year, this spring, we are gearing up for public reporting with payer and provider organizations being publicly identified. So that's that first phasing in, that first yes in that row. Um, performance improvement plans and financial penalties phase in later in the program. Next. Um, this is the list of potential factors with macroeconomic factors added. We've already talked about that. Next. Um, so I wanted to just pause here for a minute to talk about some of the alternatives that other states are considering. So our consultant um, that works with many states proposed five alternatives, um, ranging from don't do anything, leave the target as it as it is, um, leave the target as it is, but acknowledge what's happening. So provide a lot of context to the reporting, 
um, and then up to modifying the target and all the way up to waiving the target. Um, there's some notes here about what other states are doing. Um, in New England states in particular, there were some time considerations. So they, uh, in some cases, their target actually had expired. They didn't have a target set for 23, 24, 25, and so they needed to set a new target. Um, so it wasn't as much a conversation about modifying a target as much as setting it and how do we set it currently. So we had a lot to draw on from these other state experiences and the other considerations that they had. Um, we we recapped all of this for the committee last week and re-proposed these five alternatives um, and asked the committee what to do. We also provided a staff recommendation. Um, and on the next slide, let me summarize where the committee landed. Okay, so the committee agreed that we were are going to keep the cost growth target value as currently set. So it's at 3.4%. It's been 3.4% this whole time. We are not going to change that value. We are going to keep macroeconomic factors on the list of good reasons, justifiable reasons for cost growth, um, reasons that an entity might exceed the target. So that all will continue as planned. Um, the new piece here that's really key for you all to know is that we are delaying accountability for one year. So we are committing, we will not put any payer or provider organizations on a performance improvement plan for 21, 22 cost growth. So that's next year's data, the data that we'll be collecting this fall and reporting out later. We haven't even collected this data yet, but we know that this time period, um, there was a lot going on and we know there were a lot of concerns about um, accountability for cost growth in this time period. So rather than changing the target or creating, there were lots of conversations about, do we create some sort of risk adjustment or some sort of adjustment factor that would be applied across the state? The, the easiest, uh, cleanest path forward here is to just delay accountability by one year. We will continue this conversation later this year with the committee when we have some additional data. We'll have a better sense of what our statewide cost growth is and whether or not to what extent we're seeing that inflation conversation pull through, to what extent we're seeing outliers. Um, I think we really want to understand, is inflation affecting all of the health system, all payers and provider organizations equally? It might not be the case. Um, we know hospitals in particular are having a really different experience than maybe a primary care provider. So we're not sure yet how this is going to show up in measuring cost growth. And so we want to have a better sense of that before we make any actual changes to the target. So the committee agreed to this proposal. And so next slide. This is our revised timeline. So we will begin with public reporting of payer and provider organizations in April and May this year. Next year, same thing. There'll be public reporting, but performance improvement plans are being pushed out one year. So the soonest they could be applied um, would be for calendar year 2022 to 2023 cost growth. We might still revisit this conversation and have some additional changes in the future, but not until we have a little bit more data to make that decision based on. So we're going to be spending some time over the next week or two pushing this information out in a variety of ways. We know that there's been a lot of concern about accountability, and we want to make sure that folks know that this delay is now rolling out. So you'll probably hear this from us in a couple of different ways. Um, we're going to be pushing out some emails, some information on our website, and probably some other communications. But let me stop there and see if there are any questions or comments. Drew, I see your hand. Hi, Sarah. This is Drew Tarrow from Providence Health Plan. Just uh, two things. One, I've... Um, Really, I think that this this slide deck is, is publicly available, and I think I, the, the URL is down on the bottom, so I, I think that answers the question. Um, the second was, did, did any um, was there any um, was there any evidence or other states that were tying ben, um, the target to a benchmark like CPI or something similar? As I know, our own benchmark was based on like historic CPI, but yet we're not letting it fluctuate. Yeah, so this was part of the committee conversation. And um, Stacey, can you also drop the link to the November committee slide deck for sort of the full context um, for folks that want to reference it? Um, the uh, Most of the other states, their cost growth target value is directly tied to an economic indicator. So for example, it's potential growth 
gross state product plus or minus one percentage point, um, or it's CPI plus half a percent. So they have a direct link. Oregon's cost growth target is not directly linked to an economic indicator. It is informed by. So back in the day, the earlier version of the committee reviewed various economic indicators and triangulated the value of 3.4%. They looked at um, CPI, they looked at wage growth or inflation, they looked at median income, but they didn't create a formula to set the target. And other states have that formula. And so for other states, when the underlying mechanisms in that formula change or the underlying values that plug into that formula change, their target changes. Ours is not set up that way. So certainly it was part of the conversation, but it's just not um, the mechanism isn't the same. Does that answer your question, Drew? It does. And and th th for us to to index to a, a, a benchmark would require legislative action. Is that correct? Uh, not necessarily. I think it is within the advisory committee's purview to redesign the methodology for how the target is set. Um, the advisory committee is charged with specifically revisiting the target value at set points. Um, 2025 was the official set point. Um, because the target value is supposed to drop to 3.0% and we'll need to determine whether or not that's still appropriate, but they could revisit the methodology at other points in time like they did now. And there was a lot of discussion about to, whether or not to change the target value from 3.4% to something else across the November meeting and last week's meeting. And I think um, there are pros and cons, and some of this is in the meeting materials and the notes, but just as a recap, um, one of the reasons to not change the target value despite some of the changes in underlying economic indicators is the Oregon set its cost growth target for 10 years to provide predictability and stability so that there's plenty of time for payers and providers to know what the target is, to incorporate those into conversations and contract negotiations, to have time to work towards that. And the model that some other states have where they're setting their target every year um, was not preferred when this conversation originally happens. Um, it, it was uh, it was complicated and seemed like it would make some of those contracting conversations and negotiations um, much more challenging if the target was going to change every year and you wouldn't know what it was until potentially after you had already negotiated your contracts. So changing the target now, I don't wanna say arbitrarily because that's not really fair either. It's not arbitrary, but to just sort of change it and deviate away from that long-term plan and that predictability and stability um, is a concern of the committee and it's something they talked about last week. Thank you, Sarah. I will say, um, I think this was on the previous slide, um, the committee will revisit this. Um, it was clear that one of the, if you listen to the meeting last week, the discussion about accountability was should we delay accountability for one year or should we delay accountability for two years? So that was on the table. They decided not to do that in advance of having data, but I could very well see a world in which the committee has the same conversation again um, in the near future and agrees that accountability should be delayed further or that the target value really should change if economic conditions continue, um, but they didn't wanna make too many decisions in advance of having the data. Okay, other questions or comments? Do you have more slides? Not in this section of the deck. Um, there are a lot more slides in the November deck and the January deck from the committee, and I think the links up to those decks have been shared in the chat. Yeah, I, this is Bill Dwyer from Moda Health. I was just wondering, um, you know, I and I apologize if this was addressed in in some of those other decks. So I was just wondering if you've um, if you guys have made progress toward a methodology that might evaluate specialists and hospitals on their costs as opposed to just linking everything to attributed membership, which is sort of primary care focused. I think the short answer, Bill, is no. Um, we don't have any changes ready to go. There's no working proposal yet for any of that. Um, I think we are continuing to have conversations with payers and provider organizations in particular about what is driving 
those underlying costs and to what extent those might be inpatient or outpatient costs, to what extent they might be specialty costs, um, and looking at ways we can better get a handle on that. But in terms of changing the methodology, I'd say we're not having that conversation currently. Um, team, would you add anything to that? No, I think you covered it. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think um, I want to move us on because I know we promised a short meeting today and I think the next couple slides are mine also. But just to wrap this, um, I think as folks want to look through the November and January decks, um, there are also recordings from uh, last week's committee meeting available already online. If anyone wants to listen to this part of the discussion, um, that is all available. Please feel free to reach out with any other questions, comments or concerns. Um, you have our our contact information. Feel free to submit any of that to the inbox. Um, you're also welcome at any time to submit public comment to the advisory committee, and I would encourage you to do that if that's something you're interested in for the for their March meeting. Okay, uh, let's move to our last agenda item. I think I think this is our last agenda item. Okay, um, we want to give you a really quick recap of a couple of bills related to the cost growth target program that have been introduced in the legislative session. So I'm going to go through this really fast. Um, again, these are slides that we presented to the advisory committee last week, but we wanted to make sure you all had the same update. Um, next. Um, next. <laughs> Uh, okay, just a quick disclaimer. This is for information only. Um, OHA as a state agency does not have a position on any of these bills. We were not asking the advisory committee to take a position on any of these bills. We are not asking you as TAG participants to take a position on any of these bills. We just want you to know that these bills exist um, because they have the potential to modify the cost growth target program. Okay, next. Um, next. Okay, there are three bills. Um, I'm going to talk at a high level about all three of them. There are links um, for the uh, for each of the measures, and you can always sign up and follow them um, as they move through session. So, first bill is House Bill 2091. Um, it delays penalties under the Healthcare Cost Growth Target Program until 2026. So, we just talked about our delay of accountability for one year. This would delay accountability. Um, the performance improvement plans would be delayed until 2026 and the financial penalties would be delayed until 2029. So it does not change the structure of the program or the components of the program. It just moves that timeline out by about three years. Uh, okay, next. <laughs> um, the second bill is House Bill 2742. This bill excludes certain costs from consideration as total healthcare expenditures for the purpose of the healthcare cost growth target program. So the way we currently measure healthcare cost growth would be modified. This creates an exemption. So any costs that a healthcare entity incurred in meeting a community's need for accessing healthcare, including but not limited to workforce, pharmacy, and costs of essential services. And there's a really long list and definition of essential services that's tied to the prioritized list and other um, really uh, fundamental services around preventive care and chronic disease management kind of thing. So any uh, of those costs would be sort of carved out from the cost growth target. So pretty substantial change to methodology. This would impact payers and providers in terms of both data collection, measurement, and reporting um, in ways that we have not worked out yet because we'll see what happens if this bill moves and passes. But as currently proposed, it does create quite a bit of um, carve out from our current approach of what gets measured as total healthcare expenditures. The bill also has a second component that would require the state to prepare fiscal impact statements for any bills, any future bills in legislation that would affect the ability of the state or payers or providers to meet the healthcare cost growth target in the future. So essentially, if a bill was proposed that, say, was a coverage mandate, um, you know, insurers need to cover this new service, um, a new state function would be to review that bill, determine what impact, if any, it would have on the cost growth target, and then provide that information back to the state, to the legislature before they could um, move it forward or move it into, pass it into law. So pretty big uh, change that would not necessarily directly affect the cost growth target program, but certainly um, create a lot more infrastructure and insight into potential cost implications of bills affecting payers and providers. Okay, 
And next slide. Finally, third bill that we are aware of is House Bill 2085. So the bill summary here um, changes the name of the program from the healthcare cost growth target program to the premium cost growth target program. Um, it's not just a name change. Um, the details of the bill are actually pretty substantial. So it removes provider organizations from the cost growth target program entirely. Um, everywhere in the legislation and statute where provider organizations are included, it are crossed out. Um, and it really changes the cost growth target program from measuring total healthcare expenditures like we've been doing to measuring premium cost growth. So only premiums on the insurance side would be measured. Um, measure So measurement, reporting, and accountability for premium cost growth. Um, I would say that while this is not explicitly called out, it's our understanding that this would potentially exempt Medicaid coordinated care organizations because they do not have premiums. Um, so it would potentially carve them out of the cost growth target program as well. So this is a pretty substantial change in both scope um, and context for the program. This also potentially has a lot of interesting intersections with the Department of Consumer and Business Services and how they do premium rate review. So they already look at premiums. We currently don't look at premiums as part of the cost growth target program. So this is a this would be a different direction and a different switch. Okay. I think those are the bills we wanted to highlight. Do I have one more slide? Yeah, okay. So for those of you who might not be super plugged into Oregon's legislative session, um, if you're interested in tracking any of these bills or following them, want to know when they might be scheduled for a committee hearing or if any amendments are proposed and want to understand what's happening here, you can always sign up to follow them um, through the Oregon Legislative Information System. If any of these bills move or continue to be amended um, throughout legislative session, we will bring that information back to you and keep you posted. Um, this is a request from our advisory committee to provide a little bit more transparency into what's happening in session as it relates to the program, and we want to make sure to pass that on to the tag as well. So we'll keep you posted, but you are also certainly welcome and encouraged to keep an eye on these bills um, because they do potentially have some major implications for this work. Ooh, okay, and I'm over time, but any questions about legislative session? I answered some questions in the chat. Um, these are not OHA bills, and OHA has no position on these bills. This is just for informational purposes only, as all three of them directly uh, impact the cost growth target program. And as a state agency, we do not take positions on bills unless the governor uh, directs us to. So uh, no position, and that is what's happening. Okay, Chang, I think kicking it back to you to wrap us up. Yeah, uh, next slide. All right, so what what's next? We've met with uh, most of our large provider organizations. We will be providing the full list of uh, accountable provider organizations from this most uh, current 2022 um, cycle of data, hopefully before the end of the month. Um, in February, maybe into March, uh, depending on how many organizations um, we feel we would want to have a meeting with, um, we'll, we'll be meeting with those uh, organizations. Uh, so watch out for updated emails from us. Um, we, I believe the list we worked with last year hasn't changed that much. So if you haven't uh, replied back to me I, uh, in my original, hey, be on the lookout for uh, our emails, please do. I We were using the same contacts as last year. So if you have any updates, um, please let us know who we should be talking to. All right, and I think that's it. Uh, next slide. Our next meeting is uh, end of February, a uh, full meeting. We've got a couple interesting topics to talk about, including um, options for how to present uh, entity level cost growth trends in that spring report. All right, and that's it. Are there any questions before we say goodbye? All right.
Well, thanks for spending a little bit of your Wednesday morning with us. Um, if you have any questions, you could email us anytime. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.